Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. Interconnecting trails, breathtaking views, and a wealth of rivers, lakes, and ponds makes the Adirondack Mountains one of the most sought-after vacation destinations in the world. Apparently not just for humans, but for ghosts as well. Molly Briggs explores the haunted Adirondacks. Located in New York, four hours north of Manhattan and two hours south of Montreal, the area has attracted hikers, fishermen, and hunters from around the globe. The Adirondack region is an area rich in history and exquisite natural beauty. At night, you'll be treated to a view of the unpolluted, vast, starry sky accompanied by the hellish screech of a barred owl or a young fox. By day, you may hear the constant chatter of active, some say mythical, forest creatures searching for food within the wooded pines they fiercely protect. The natural Adirondack playground is a destination meant for everyone. Although some who once came to the region for fun, a flight of fancy, or to improve their humdrum lives remain within the coveted back country. Their murdered souls are eternally tethered to the soil of the mountains by the trauma of unrequited love and unsolicited death. Denied by heaven and hell, their ghostly apparitions are forever trapped along the rocky banks of the Adirondack's unpredictable waters and dark, mysterious forests. On July 11, 1906, Grace Brown set out for a boat ride along Big Moose Lake in Eagle Bay with her lover, a trip from which only one of them would return. As a little girl, Grace Brown lived in South Otsalik, Shenango County, New York. At 18, she moved to Cortland with her sister Ada and her family and began working for the Gillette Skirt Factory as a seamstress. She met and soon fell in love with the factory owner's nephew, Chester Gillette. Grace developed an innocent schoolgirl crush on Chester, which would be a fatal mistake. The couple kept their love affair secret until the spring of 1906, when Grace, now 20, discovered she was pregnant. Unable to face the consequences of his actions, Chester lured Grace to the Adirondack Mountains on the promise of marriage. Although it is still unclear what Chester's murderous plan was, or if he even had one, we know that he eventually checked into a hotel under an assumed name and with sinister intentions. Chester falseheartedly escorted the mother of his unborn baby down the river in a small boat. Suddenly, raising a tennis racket that was once strapped to his monogrammed suitcase, he struck Grace on the back of her head, causing her to fall into Big Moose Lake and drown. After a three-week trial, Chester was found guilty of the careless murder of Grace Brown. On March 30, 1908, Chester Gillette died by electrocution. However, that is not the end of the story. One would argue on the topic of murder or any sudden or traumatic death, it never is. It's evident that the spirit of Grace Brown continues to roam the thickly forested area of the Adirondack Mountains. Locals say she often appears along the water where she was ruthlessly murdered, mourning the body of her unborn child. Although some say she's seeking revenge on the cowardly soul of her bloodthirsty lover. Whatever the case may be, the ghost of Grace Brown has been seen within the area of the Covewood Lodge on Big Moose Lake for more than a hundred years. Rhonda Buslot, a one-time employee at the Covewood Lodge, reportedly walked up to the second floor of the building and reached for the pull string of the overhead light. 
Suddenly, Rhonda had the distinct feeling that someone was standing in front of her. However, no one was there. She stood, breathless, frozen in her tracks. Rhonda stated, it lingered for only a few seconds, then it moved away. I didn't see anything myself, but I felt that somebody was right there. At the same time, her friends, who were standing just outside the lodge, reported seeing a ghostly figure through the second-floor window. Another employee, Linda Lee Mackin, encountered the ghost of Grace Brown just a few months later. Linda described walking toward Big Moose Lake, the glow from her flashlight becoming increasingly dim. By the time she reached the edge of the lake, her flashlight was no longer working. Linda turned around and headed back to the lodge. She returned with a friend a few minutes later only to find the ghost of Grace Brown appearing out of the mist on the bank of Big Moose Lake. Linda, along with being thoroughly shocked, also reported feeling an instant, overwhelming sense of sadness. The unanticipated feelings of grief confirmed for Linda that it was, in fact, the spirit of the young mother she had encountered. Most visitors come to the Adirondack Mountains for fun, but back in the 1870s, Dr. Edward Livingston Trudeau came for a cure. Stricken with tuberculosis, he was soon healed by the area's clean mountain air and the upcountry's peaceful, soul-nurturing natural practices. Trudeau established the first of its kind in the United States tuberculosis sanitarium in Saranac Lake, New York, eventually calling the small village home. Wealthy families traveled to the sanitarium seeking recovery within one of many cure cottages a name given to the local homes in the area catering to those inflicted with tuberculosis. Many of the sick who came to the Adirondack region in search of a cure for tuberculosis recovered from the devastating disease, although some were not so lucky. In the end, money may buy you happiness, but I'm pretty sure it can't bring you back from the dead. Yet. Unfortunately, death from a disease one did not ask for or deserve can sometimes bring on a sort of spiritual resentment, sparking more than just a handful of random hauntings that tend to leave those of us left behind questioning our reality. A worker from the Trudeau Sanitarium reported seeing a young boy with a thin, skeletal face staring at her from the inside of an abandoned home, a home that was padlocked from the outside. Another story comes from a worker who witnessed a mysterious janitor walking to and from a boarded-up home that was also abandoned. The Trudeau Sanitarium is only one of the many haunted locations paranormal enthusiasts fastidiously explore. Twenty miles north of Malone, New York, on the edge of the Canadian border, is the hamlet of Fort Covington. Rich in farmland and historical significance, Fort Covington is also well known for being a hotspot of paranormal activity. During the War of 1812, the fort was used as a blockhouse to shelter wounded soldiers. Over 23,000 Americans, British, and Canadian soldiers lost their lives in the war, also known as the Second War of Independence, where for the first time in history, America declared war on a foreign nation, Great Britain. A wood-framed Victorian home a young couple had turned into an antique shop was located in the area of Fort Covington and was precariously haunted. Alone in the shop at night, the owner stated that unexplained noises and curious activity would often occur. Lights would turn on and off, doors would open all by themselves, and heavy objects would move from their shelves at random and unassisted. One night, the owner recalled an unseen hand changing the station to her radio playing in another room. A more chilling personal experience relates to the climate within a small room located near the back of the Centurion home. No matter how high the owners would set the thermostat, the narrow room used to store vintage clothing maintained a constant wintry temperature. The owner, along with some of her customers, clearly felt the presence of something supernatural lurking inside the home. However, all hauntings are not exclusive to the bitter souls of military men alone. Sometimes the spooky encounters involve the women behind the soldiers. Nye Manor, also known as Parkhurst House, dates back to 1827, 
and was a home built for Army Major Jabez Parkhurst. Parkhurst was an abolitionist and a committed member of the Underground Railroad. Many people died within the home, including Parkhurst's first wife and daughter. Both women committed suicide. Fidelia, his wife, suffered from mental derangement, taking her life in 1849, and Caroline, the major's daughter, killed herself shortly after her husband's death and one year after the death of her only child. It's easy to see how devastating earthly traumas can lend themselves to mysterious, ghostly happenings. A recent owner of the Parkhurst home, working late one night, claims to have heard a female voice calling out to him. Hearing the soft, feminine voice say simply, hello. The owner's wife reports that she is prone to feel suddenly sad when roaming into certain parts of the refurbished house. Both have heard footsteps within the home with no earthly explanation of where they came from. Neighbors of the Parkhurst house can also confirm odd activity, stating that they recall seeing lights glowing brightly on the second floor of the 18th century home when it was clearly boarded up and without power. Whether you are someone looking for a paranormal adventure within a densely wooded forest or simply seeking a stroll through one of the many historical homes in the naturally majestic region whose occupants are decidedly more than happy to offer their visitors a ghostly adventure of their own, the Adirondack Mountains are definitely a perfect fit. If you live in and around Denver, Colorado, or are planning to visit there, Paranormality Magazine recently gave us a few paranormal hotspots to look for. Denver International Airport Many individuals attribute these potential hauntings and the airport's troubled construction to the very land upon which it stands. Instead of seeking an alternative location, the airport was erected on hallowed ground that holds great significance for Native American tribes. This decision has stirred controversy and raised questions about the spiritual repercussions of disturbing this sacred land. The airport's haunted reputation has only fueled the curiosity of intrepid travelers drawn to the enigmatic phenomena that surround it. Reports of paranormal activities and unexplained events have circulated widely, adding a supernatural allure to the already mystifying atmosphere. Cheeseman Park harbors a mysterious past. Once a solemn burial ground, it now stands as a testament to the intersection of history and the present. Initially intended as a final resting place for all, fate would decree it a cemetery primarily for the destitute, the diseased, and even the outlaws of a bygone era. As time wore on, neglect slowly consumed the cemetery, and a transformative decision took shape. The land's purpose shifted paving the way for its metamorphosis into the enchanting park we know today. Yet whispers of the past linger, as it is believed that the spirits and ghosts of approximately 2,000 souls still rest beneath its surface. These ethereal inhabitants, forever tied to Cheeseman Park, are said to wander its grounds in a state of melancholy and confusion. For those residing in the vicinity of this mystical place, Tales of ghostly apparitions have become a part of their reality. Witnesses claim to have encountered specters with sorrowful countenances, lost in the liminal space between the corporeal and the ephemeral. It is said that the air around them carries whispers of forgotten voices and haunting moans, evoking a sense of foreboding in the hearts of those who dare to listen. A palpable aura of sadness and desolation often permeates the atmosphere, leaving an indelible mark on the souls of those who visit. The Molly Brown House Museum In James Cameron's Titanic, if you were to inquire about our favorite character, we would likely mention Molly Brown. Portrayed by Kathy Bates, Molly Brown was a spirited and helpful Denverite who passionately cheered for Jack's triumphs. While Jack and Rose were fictional characters, apologies to the incurable romantics, Molly Brown was a real person. She embodied independence and fearlessly challenged societal norms. 
Following her survival of the Titanic's tragic sinking, she achieved a level of celebrity status. Even after her passing, her Denver residence was lovingly restored and transformed into a museum, inviting the public to explore her remarkable life. However, intriguing rumors persist regarding Molly and her husband's enduring determination, both in life and beyond. It is said that their stubborn presence lingers within their former abode. Numerous visitors have claimed to witness Molly and her husband wandering the halls of the museum. Some even swear by the distinct scent of a phantom cigar smoke wafting from Mr. Brown's quarters. These accounts add an extra layer of fascination to the legacy of Molly Brown, ensuring that her spirited essence lives on, captivating and enchanting all who encounter her remarkable story. The renowned Stanley Hotel, situated near Denver and Estes Park, served as a profound inspiration for Stephen King's novel The Shining. It's not hard to comprehend why. The hotel is steeped in tales of apparitions. Among the most renowned specters are the original owners of the hotel, Freeland Oscar Stanley and his wife Flora. They are often cited in the hotel's public spaces, engaged in business and endeavoring to assist guests, as if they were still among the living. In room 217, guests have reported encounters with the ghost of former housekeeper Elizabeth Wilson, who allegedly climbs into bed with them or neatly folds their clothing while they slumber. Capitol Hill In the past, Denver's most affluent individuals established their homes on Capitol Hill, solidifying its status as a prestigious neighborhood. As time passed and the city expanded, a notable phenomenon occurred. Some of these former residents seemingly never left. Despite the addition of modern apartment complexes and condominiums, the echoes of their presence linger within the neighborhood. The historic mansions once inhabited by the elite still stand tall, bearing witness to a bygone era. However, alongside the contemporary developments, these ethereal inhabitants make their presence known to the new residents. Within the confines of Capitol Hill's buildings, a spectral presence can be felt, their intangible forms occupying the governor's mansion and the state capitol. Furthermore, these apparitions occasionally venture beyond their architectural confines, strolling the streets of Capitol Hill and gathering in the park. Their ethereal nature grants them an eternal attachment to this captivating city. Any visit to Denver's Capitol Hill is bound to include an encounter with one of these former residents forever intertwined with the fabric of this beautiful urban landscape. Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators, as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country, incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com paranormalitymag.com You know that you have a very haunted county when an author can write a series of articles on just the hotels that are haunted in your county. And Billy White brings us the Gadsden Hotel in Cochise County, Arizona. 
When most people think of road tripping through Arizona, they think of some of the larger and more well-known tourist attractions. Hiking through the Grand Canyon, possibly skiing up north of Flagstaff, shopping in Scottsdale. One thing that each of these locations has in common is that they are all located in the northern half of the state, and it is a big state. In fact, probably the most well-known haunted hotel in Arizona is the Jerome Grand Hotel located in the mining town of Jerome, Arizona, north of Phoenix and a little southwest of Flagstaff. What many visitors to the Grand Canyon State miss is a small southeastern county that is full of haunted mysteries. Cochise County sits right in the southeast corner of the state of Arizona. Its southern border runs along the American-Mexican border and its eastern edge connects with New Mexico. When you talk about Arizona with people who aren't familiar with the state, many do not realize that there is a whole portion of the state that lies below Tucson. Cochise County is one of these areas. Rich in history, Cochise County receives its name from Cochise, a leader in a group of Chiricahua Apache who resided in this area before European colonization. In fact, there is a beautiful campground in the area, Cochise Stronghold, where Cochise's remains are rumored to be hidden. When settlers were expanding to the west, the area that became Cochise County boomed with miners and mining interests. Two towns that experienced a mining boom were Bisbee and Tombstone. There was a third town, Douglas, that benefited indirectly from the mining interests as it was the local smelter for any of the minerals found in the area. Unfortunately, mines dry up and boom towns shrivel. Each of these towns have had struggles to find a foothold in modern society post-mining. Bisbee and Tombstone do so by embracing the tourist industry. On the other hand, Douglas straddles the Arizona-Mexico border with its sister city, Agua Prieta, and in 2023 is still trying to find its rebirth in the modern economy. Out of these three towns, Douglas is the largest, but still its population is just around 15,000. Bisbee and Tombstone each have populations between 3,000 and 5,000, much smaller than their prime during the copper and silver boom. The Douglas of today does not have a lot of frills, amenities, or entertainment. The Supercenter Walmart is the main shopping resource. While there is an old downtown area, Douglas has not had the resource of a tourism industry to support revitalization. Its sister city across the border, Agua Prieta, is much larger and contains more of the modern conveniences and entertainment. Douglas does have one shining star that remains from its frontier golden age, the Gadsden Hotel. The Gadsden, named after the Gadsden Purchase, originally opened its doors in 1907. However, the first hotel was destroyed by a fire and rebuilt in 1929. Besides ghosts, the Gadsden has hosted Thornton Wilder, who ended up extending his stay to two months, and Eleanor Roosevelt. There's a chip in the large marble staircase that extends out through the lobby Local urban legend attributes the chip to a story that Pancho Villa once rode his horse into the lobby of the hotel and up that staircase. While Villa did stay in the hotel, the horse in the lobby story does seem a little outlandish. It doesn't take a lot of digging or talking to locals and hotel faculty to hear ghost stories associated with the Gadsden Hotel. Because they received so many claims of paranormal activity, employees of the hotel began keeping records of the paranormal reports that were brought to them by guests. If you ask the front desk to see the paranormal records, they will allow you to sit and enjoy the primary accounts of encounters with the Gadsden's ghosts at your own pace. It shouldn't be surprising that the beautiful marble staircase, that of Pancho Villa's legend, is at the center of many of the guests' ghost stories in the Gadsden. The most common and mild stories involve seeing ghostly figures ascending or descending the beautiful staircase. I have to admit, it is such a gorgeous staircase I can see why someone would want to continue visiting it in the afterlife. Following the staircase, the room with the most activity seems to be room 333. Former guests who have stayed in room 333 say that they have heard disembodied knocks throughout the room. The TV turns itself on and off 
and they have heard conversations that appear to be coming from invisible visitors right inside their room. However, I spoke with a former employee who had a darker story about Room 333. He stated that when the room is empty, there are many times where hotel staff will hear a deep growling that comes from inside of the room as they walk past the door. He said that they've also heard what sounds like scratching coming from inside the room when it's unoccupied. There is truly no single ghost story that accompanies Room 333. Many hotels will have a particular ghost who has a tragic story, like one that we will look into with the Bisbee Grand Hotel. Is whatever remains in Room 333 an entity left behind after the Gadsden's tragic fire? Is it something darker? The ghosts of the Gadsden do not stay in one room or on the staircase. Former managers and former employees have encountered spirits throughout the hotel. The former employee who spoke about their encounter in room 333 told a story about an arcade game that had been placed in the lobby to entertain guests who visit the lobby's bar, restaurant, and coffee shop. However, employees who worked the night shift started hearing the game being played throughout odd hours after all of the businesses had closed down and the lobby was empty. They eventually decided to unplug the machine for some peace and quiet. Unfortunately, even unplugging the machine did not quiet the spirits that wanted to play games late into the night. The staff continued to hear the game after it had been unplugged. Finally, the game was removed from the lobby. The lobby ghosts also enjoyed calling to the employees of the hotel. Those working the night staff would occasionally hear their names being called from somewhere in the lobby well after the hotel had gotten quiet for the night. When they went to look for the source of the disturbance, there was nothing and no one in the lobby. This is one of those occurrences at the Gadsden that the staff has acknowledged just comes with working at the historic hotel. Arizona is a state with lots of history and with history comes ghosts and paranormal activity. Cochise County is a small, rural area built mainly by mining, farming, and ranching around the turn of the century. Cochise County embodies much of the legends of the Wild West associated with American legend, and it holds many fascinating ghost stories. Some of these ghosts have chosen to continue to inhabit beautiful hotels in the region. The Gadsden in Douglas is just one hotel with both a rich history and exciting spirits. Even if you don't encounter something paranormal, the beauty of the hotel is worth a visit. In the August 2023 edition of Paranormality Magazine, Caleb Pearson had the opportunity to write an article about Keith Linder, author of The Bothell Hell House, after interviewing him. Here's what Caleb wrote. Supernatural events have been reported throughout the entirety of human history, even back before the first civilizations. Throughout that time, criticism has been had, fear has been wrought, and even death has been brought about by such events. Sadly, an often overlooked part of paranormal encounters is the physiological aftereffects related to them, which was clearly brought up to my attention when interviewing Keith Linder, author of the book The Bothell Hell House, Poltergeist of Washington State, which I will link to in the show notes. Throughout the interview, I got the clear impression that he was telling the truth and struggled to find much to criticize him on, even if I wanted to, considering the things that he has gone through. Because of this, I ask that you keep an open mind when reading about the following events and opinions regarding Keith Linder and his experiences in a house some believe to be an actual portal to hell. In the quiet little town of Bothell, Washington, a house stood. It was newly constructed and for all intents and purposes was seemingly normal. When Keith Linder moved into this house, he thought the same and had no reason to suspect otherwise. For four whole years, he and his girlfriend lived in the home, which soon revealed itself to be inhabited by a supposed malevolent spirit. They both suffered from the hauntings while living there and long after they moved away. The attacks on their person and home shocked them to their very core, 
and they even lost several friends over the events, as some were either too scared to go near the house or left in disgust when they thought it was all a lie. The encounters, admittedly, started out rather small. Items appeared and disappeared mysteriously around the house, cabinets were opened, items were thrown about as though they offended the spirit, etc. At first, it took them some time before they even realized that there was another presence in their home, and even after they accepted that there was something there, they thought at first that it was simply the spirit of a child, non-threatening and merely there because of some unknown reason. But it did not take long for events to prove otherwise, and they quickly came to regret moving to the house in Bothell. It's easy to see why they thought it was just the spirit of a child meandering about the house at first. They would hear things that sounded like a child coughing, and children's toys would appear randomly around the house despite Keith and his girlfriend not having any kids. Still, at this point, nothing overt was happening, and they were somewhat content with living with the ghost, since it appeared to have no negativity towards them, and it too seemed content with them for a time. However, this time of relative calm did not last long, and something happened that destroyed the thought of the ghost being the spirit of the young, something that would leave me unable to sleep at night knowing it was there. Keith was sitting in his office doing some sort of work when he heard a click of a light switch, and he was drowned in darkness. He looked up thinking it was his girlfriend, and saw the ghost itself. He froze in place, not knowing what to think. Before him stood what he called a gray lady. It was a full-grown woman in the doorway of his office, staring at him for a long moment as if wanting something before walking around the corner and disappearing without a trace. What struck me as odd about the event and made me believe Keith even more was the fact that the so-called ghost didn't have any of the big cliches we all seem to associate with hauntings. The clothing, in contrast to most ghosts somehow always being from the dark ages of the Civil War, was modern day, breaking the platitude of ghosts from hundreds of years ago. His account claimed that it was some sort of woman with an unclear face and matted clothing. She was about five foot six inches tall. I would put her below 115, 111 pounds, very frail, very thin, thin angel hair, shoulder length, very petite looking, which I found interesting considering the strength and aggressiveness shown by the ghost in the past. However, despite the attitude of the ghost in previous events, it simply walked away and did nothing more to attack or indicate what it wanted, making me and Keith apparently question its motives and intentions. Historically, ghost hauntings come and go like a pendulum, getting more and less extreme as time goes on. Keith learned this the hard way. There was an entire year with no activity at all, and he thought, on some level, that he was safe from the spirit. But that time of peace was soon broken, and things started hitting dangerous levels. When asked about the events, Keith went on to explain that, in regard to the events after the long pause in activity in 2013, it gets worse the second time around. He explained that he read about the different signs that the websites warned of, but no amount of warning could prepare you for because it just comes out of nowhere. Some people may think that having a ghost in your house would be cool or entertaining, but when things ramp up to the dangerous levels that Keith experienced, they learned that their wish for a ghost was very much unfounded. Keith's ghost, the Grey Lady, appeared to have an inherent hate for anyone in its house. Glass was shattered, entire pieces of furniture thrown, and Keith was even supposedly pushed down the stairs, injuring him for an extended period. I know it tried to hurt me, he said but luckily its attempts failed outside of the stairs injury. Even before the events escalated, they searched for answers, going so far as to recruit priests to cleanse their home multiple times, but it did nothing but lessen the effects for a short period of time, and even seemed to anger the ghost more than it already was. In fact, holy items and cleansings did so little that the spirit was able to reportedly burn multiple Bibles within the home, and would turn crosses upside down. 
huge, evil messages were left on the walls. The number of hell 666 was painted on a door, and a message for Keith to die was left for him to find on his birthday one year, which I can imagine left his day ruined, especially since it was a day that was supposed to be a happy one. One thing I noticed was that fire and ash seemed to be a prevailing theme in the home, as random things would catch fire with no apparent cause or explanation. In fact, Keith once had the very clothes on his back spontaneously combust, leaving burns on his body. The writings on the walls, which Keith said he had samples of tested, were apparently made with a kind of ash-based paint called bone black, which is a type of paint made of ground and burnt bison bone. The connection to fire and ash paired the inability to be cleansed by anything holy to me implies that the home had some sort of connection to hell itself, which I imagine may be a common thought of those that believe Keith. Sometime after the encounter with the Grey Lady, Keith was approached, unprovoked, by a paranormal investigative show called Ghost Adventures. Hoping they'd be able to help in some way, Keith allowed them to research and film the home. After the brief investigation, the episode regarding the house aired, and to the shock of both Keith and his family, the show painted them in a very bad light. They took a heavy-handed approach, Keith says, but the actual investigation was five hours. It made it seem like, while the episode was airing, that they did everything they could and found nothing. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Even simple tests require more than a single try if you want a truly accurate conclusion, especially if you follow the scientific method. You're looking for lightning in a jar, says Keith. It's very hard to catch the phenomenon at its apex when you're an investigator because by the time they're showing up, the activity has subsided. Keith, dumbstruck at being railroaded by the show, went on to say, nothing can be constant 365 days a year, but it comes in waves. In fact, the show was informed by Keith that the activity had been almost non-existent for several weeks preceding their visit to the home. A competent investigator should have known that you likely will need to investigate the site multiple times and at a later date when the activity starts happening again. Any good paranormal investigator should know that poltergeists have no pattern and don't do things just because you want them to. In fact, they do quite the opposite. This makes me question the authenticity of any investigation that these so-called investigators have done on their show. After the episode aired, Keith and his girlfriend received extreme backlash from the public. They were sent messages online, comments were made, and their names were dragged through the mud. It's my understanding that these things still happen today on occasion, and the injustice of the situation struck me as almost evil in its own way. The backlash was, in my eyes, twice as bad as the hauntings themselves. Now we've got two things to contend with, he said, the spirits in this house, and we've got to contend with the outside world labeling us pranksters, hoaxers, fakers, attention-seeking. I could feel the frustration rolling off him, and quite honestly, it made me question why anyone would want to lie about having a haunting since this is the result of speaking up. It hurt to read that stuff, the wild stuff said about us. And having read some of them myself when researching Keith's claims before the interview, I can see why. I'm not asking you to believe Keith's story, nor do I ask that you do for any story someone gives you. However, I do ask that you, dear reader, think about things for yourself. The paranormal isn't exactly a science. Variations exist and not every story is the same. Just because some things don't match up to your expectations or you haven't seen things for yourself before doesn't mean that they don't exist. If you do examine someone's claims of the supernatural and find yourself not believing, it is probably best to dismiss it and move on. Don't drag someone's name through the mud just because you find their story a little far-fetched. Think about how that would affect you if the same thing happened in your home and people criticized you for something they don't believe. Nobody deserves to be attacked online or in person regarding a claim. For all you know, their story is true, and you just have failed to see past your own skepticism.
Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.